All right, so Shai will continue telling us about the uh, high dimensional expanders and more wonders. Uh, yes, so uh, thanks again for inviting me to give a second talk. Uh, so today's talk will be, actually it will be uh, independent of uh, last week talk, other than the fact that uh, the name Garland will appear here, but uh, it will be, you don't need to recall what uh, happened in the last talk. And uh, on the other hand, the point of this talk is to kind of motivate it uh, what I said last week about the Garland method being a local to global method. And even though the titles of, it, of this talk is high dimensional expanders, I'm going to explain the entire method just in the language of graphs. And actually I, I, I want to even advertise uh, this method as a new way to construct expander graphs. Uh, so as uh, most of you uh, are well aware, uh, there, there's, if one is interested in constructing explicit expander graphs, uh, there are a few ways to do it. Uh, this, they were first constructed by with using Kashdan property T by Margulis and using the Ramanujan conjecture. So these are very uh, deep results coming from representation theory of uh, uh, semi-simple groups. Uh, the third method uh, due to Engel, Vadhan and uh, Wigderson is considerably more elementary. You don't need to know representation theory at all in order to get expanders from it. Uh, another method goes under the rubric of super strong approximation and uh, not to be confused with strong approximation. And it's due to Bourguin and Gumbord also requires a deep analysis and some knowledge in group theory. And lastly, there was the breakthrough of uh, Marcus Spielman and Srivastava using the interlacing polynomials. And, and this, uh, this is not a random method and it was made, I think Cohen made it explicit in a way I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so these are the, the ways to construct expanders. And as far as I know, these are the only way to construct explicit expanders. These are the main rubrics. And I want to tell you about a new way, uh, which also it dates back, uh, I mean, it really it's an old method, but it was not used for this purpose. And, and this is Garland's method. It's a local, local to global, expansion machinery. And I, two weeks ago, there was a, a nice colloquium talk by Uzawa. Uh, and so I just wanted to mention that there might be even a, another method, which I don't understand very well, but it's supposed to be much more powerful than the Garland's method. It should, it's supposed to contain it, uh, going under the name of semi-definite programming for spectral gap. Um, and just to mention the last two methods, both the Garland method and the semi-definite programming are in some sense related to or motivated by Kashdan property T, but their advantage is that you do not need to know what is Kashdan property T in order to construct expanders from them, okay? So in a way I will never define what is Kashdan property T in this talk, but I will prove to you that certain graphs are expanded. Okay, and, and let me also uh, very quickly uh, mention some advantages and uh, disadvantages for uh, the Gallant method. So if the first advantage is that it is completely elementary. You only need to know basic linear algebra. Uh, the first year linear al uh, algebra of undergrads, it's, it suffice to understand uh, the entire proof. Its disadvantage is that Currently, I, know, I only know very few cases for which it works. So it's not like a robust method to construct expanders. It will give you ex families of infinite families of expanders, but you kind of, you will ask me where did it came from and I won't be able to give you a good answer. Uh, a second advantage is that it proves expansion by only looking at the local behavior of the graph. Its disadvantage is that I, if, I, if you were to give me a, for instance, the Cayley graph. And so I'll be able to look locally and tell you that each, each connected component of it is an expander. I won't be able to settle the issue of whether the graph is connected. So this is the pros and cons for the method. 
And let me give you a somewhat simple example to see that everything is quite explicit. Uh, so how the method work. Uh, so the first step is that I kind of give you some uh, magical generating set S. It's a finite set uh, S of three by three matrices. There are 14 elements inside S. All the matrices are uh, algebraic uh, numbers. Uh, almost integer apart from having maybe you might need to divide by two. And from these matrices, you can, thinking of them as uh, three by three uh, invertible matrices, you can actually take the modulo Q for any prime Q. And what you get is uh, Cayley graphs. And using the, the method I'm going to tell you about today, uh, the Garland method, these Cayley graphs uh, will be shown to be expanded. Simple, straightforward, explicit. And now there are two caveats in, in what I just said. One is you should ask me, where did you, how did you pick the set S? I can't tell you that. And the second is, I mean, I can tell you what I want S to satisfy, but I can't tell you how to generate S quickly. And the second question is, uh, these Cayley graphs is, is nice when you know what the group G is. This is the group generated by S. And I know for a fact that this group sits inside the projective general linear three by three matrices. Uh, but it would be nice if I could just tell you that the group is this ambient group of projective general linear groups. Uh, and it, it is true, but proving it, it's not, uh, it's, I, I can't do it elementary. I need to invoke some results from group theory. So this is a second caveat. And this result, again, I, I just want to emphasize, it's called strong approximation, not to be confused with the super strong approximation for the first slide, which is a method of proving expansion. The strong approximation, it's a method of proving connect, connectedness of Cayley. Uh, okay. Now, in the previous example that I showed you, uh, so the only the only reason that you can say the, the only thing that prevents you from saying if the GP is the entire PGL three is connectedness. Yeah, that's the, a, that's the only thing that can go wrong. It's equivalent. It's it, it means the same thing. So GP GQ is PGL three is equivalent to saying that. Uh, S generate PGL3, which is equivalent to saying that the Cayley graph of PGL3 with respect to S is connected. All of them are the same. Thanks. Yeah. And please feel free to interrupt and ask uh, any question or make any remark. Okay, so in the previous uh, example of Mumford, um, you might, it, it, here's, here's a question I can answer. You, you might ask, what do you need S to satisfy in order for the claim to work? And we will uh, prove it in full generality, but uh, at this point, I can already tell you what is the special property of uh, the previous example. And it's a property of S, and it's the property that the link, uh, the links of this uh, Cayley graph, you can actually define the, the these graphs are in fact skeleton of a two-dimensional complex. And so actually they have links. Or you can just, if you don't, if you haven't been to last week talk, you can just take this definition as uh, the, the definition of a link of the graph XQ. So it is a graph whose sets of vertices is the generating set S. And you connect two elements from S by an edge in this link graph if the inverse of one times the other belongs to the set as well. So uh, this is a graph on 13, uh, 14 vertices. And in fact, it is three regular, every vertex has three neighbors in this link graph. And moreover, it's, it's a very well-known graph. It's the graph of uh, points versus lines uh, in the projective plane over the field of two elements, also known as the Heedwood graph. There's a picture of it. And a special feature of this 
uh, graph is that its second largest eigenvalue, it's uh, square root two, and it is strictly, this is important, strictly smaller than half the degree of the graph. So the second that I know this fact that the length, that the link has this excellent expansion property, I can uh, apply the garden to it. Uh, here's a non-example of a, a case where you don't have this uh, excellent local expansion. And this is actually, this is the common situation. So for instance, you take uh, the following graph, you tessellation of, I don't know, the plane or a tori or uh, think of this as just part of the, uh, some graph. And you look at uh, the green vertex and you look at uh, its link. So you get the sixth cycle and the second largest eigenvalue is equal to uh, of this uh, six cycle is equal to one, which is precisely equal to half the degree. And, the, and here the Garland's method uh, does not work. And I'll say more about it. But in any case, the, the previous example, it's, it's kind of rare. It's, it's not that easy to find such generating set with, uh, which give you excellent expanding links. Wait, so when you say the largest eigenvalue of what and the, la and the degree of what? Yeah, so the largest eigenvalue, so uh, if you look at the graph here, comprised of the blue and red vertices, uh, oh, the six cycle. Just so, the pentagon itself, okay. Yeah, so this is, a, a, this is just a graph, a two regular graph, and it has eigenvalues, and the largest eigenvalues of the degree. And... Uh, okay, so now let's, uh, we leave the, the example behind. Let's be very uh, general. So uh, X will now be a finite undirected graph. Uh, here, this is just a, a well-known uh, well uh, notation. So. I'll denote by L2 of X all the real valued function on the vertices of the graph. Uh, the gra this uh, vector space has an inner product uh, and there is a well-defined norm coming from the inner product. A will be the normalized adjacency operator and normalizing by the degree of each vertex. And the spec of A will just be the set of the uh, eigenvalues of A. And the maximum among all the eigenvalues apart from the first one will be called the normalized search, second largest eigenvalue. And now here are some well-known facts coming from spectral graph theory. So the first eigenvalue is equal to one and all the other ones are smaller or equal than one in absolute value. And the second largest eigenvalue uh, is smaller than one if and only if the graph is connected and the, the the last eigenvalue is bigger than minus one if and only if the graph is non bipartite And we have the normalized trigger uh, constant, uh, but we won't uh, deal with it much. We'll just, uh, when, so expansion is defined using the trigger constant, but uh, thanks to the discrete trigger inequality, uh, it suffice to prove a spectral gap. So uh, throughout the talk, I'll, I'll, the the proof that anything is expansion would invoke the discrete trigger inequality and I'll just show that the, the second largest eigenvalue is bounded away from one in a uniform way. What, what is K in the previous? Oh, uh, ah, okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, I guess it's I had in mind that this is- The great K uh, regular graph? Yeah, it, it should be like the, so I, I normalize it, but it, yeah, it's not, so if, if the graph is not regular, then the normalization is the highest degree or the average degree? So the, well, I think it's the average degree, but forget about it. All the graphs will be regular. Yes, all the graphs will be in, in this type of way. What is a non-regular graph? There is no such thing. Uh, okay. And so uh, again, just, uh, I'm sure you all know it, but for applications, one, in, one is interested in a, a, a graphs in which the second largest eigenvalue is as small as possible, 
and the well-known notion of Ramanujan graphs are k-regular graphs which satisfy this bound, and uh, uh, Alon Bopana tells us that asymptotically this is the best you can hope for, but not asymptotically you can do better, actually. It's important to keep in mind. Uh, for instance, you can look at the graph of points versus line in the projective plane. It is a Q plus one regular uh, uh, bipartite graph on uh, two times Q squared plus Q plus one vertices. And this graph achieves better, so they are Ramanujan, but they are better than Ramanujan. They improve Ramanujan by a factor of two. And we will use this fact. I, I, by the way, I don't know who to attribute this uh, result. I mean, we can, it's not hard to prove it, but I don't know who is the first one to really uh, prove this uh, inequality. Well, there, there, uh, there's an old paper of Noga Alon on the spectral properties of, um, you know, uh, um, projective graphs, if you want. I mean, projective planes, projective spaces, and they were calculated. I'm sure it was known also before. It's very, like you say, it's very easy to calculate the paper from the mid 80s. I want to comment that uh, when you say in the non-asymptotic, you can improve it. I mean, the Alonba Pana uh, tells you that, uh, uh, you know, uh, what you lose or what you gain if you uh, don't have asymptotics. I mean, there's, uh, these graphs are extremely dense. Their degree is about square root the size of the graph. And that's the reason you get a better bound. But you know what the optimal is essentially for any uh, if you look at constant degree, you cannot improve, um, you know, you cannot improve this factor too. Yeah, yeah, I, 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 I know I just wanted to emphasize because some people kind of uh, raise the question when, when we mentioned this bound that this could not be achieved, but it can, you just, you just give up the fact that you want your graph to be like one. Bounded degree. Bounded degree. Yeah. Uh, okay, so now let's begin uh, setting up the, uh, the uh, how Garland's method will work. And so Garland's method really applies for two-dimensional simplicial complexes. Uh, but we will, uh, at the end of the day, we will just, uh, at some point, we'll just forget about uh, in application uh, for graphs, we'll just forget about the fact that we have triangles. And what you can just think about is uh, graphs with a lot of uh, uh, triangles in them. So, okay, so in any case, X will be a finite, pure two-dimensional simplicial complex. Pure means that every edge is contained in a triangle. And let's recall the definition of a link. So, uh, for any vertex in, uh, in the complex, xv will denote the link graph of, uh, uh, of v and x. So the, verti the vertices of the link graph are the neighbors of v, and the edges of the link graph are the edges such that together with v, they form a triangle. And now I'm going to just, from now on, assume, even though the theorem can be made to work without this assumption, uh, for simplicity's sake, I'll just assume and that I'm completely regular. Every vertex is contained in precisely K1 edges and every edge is contained in precisely K2 triangles. And so every link graph is a K2 regular graph on K1 vertices. And to the, to the complex, uh, we can associate the, the normalized adjacency operator of its underlying graph denoted by A. And for any vertex V, uh, uh, A subscript V will be the normalized adjacency operator of the link. And so uh, we are interested in, in two parameters. So lambda uh, will be the normalized second largest eigenvalue of the global underlying graph. And mu will just be the maximum among all the second largest eigenvalues of all the links. If all the links are the same, then it's quite easy to determine mu. And the whole theorem tells you that you can bound lambda by an expression in terms of mu. So lambda is smaller or equal to mu divided by one minus mu. And this is, a, and this is the main point of the local to global method. 
because mu is local, lambda is global, and if you know that mu is bounded away from uh, half minus any epsilon, any positive number, then you will get a, a global consequence that lambda is bounded away uniformly from one. And just to emphasize this theorem, which is always true, but it's only useful when mu is uh, smaller than half, as we've seen before. And the corollary, so I'm going to prove that theorem, but just uh, already I can mention the corollary. So suppose you, you start with a finite pure two-dimensional simplicial complex, such that its links are excellent expander. The, the local expansion is strictly smaller than uh, half minus epsilon. This, the, the second largest eigenvalue of all the links is strictly smaller than half minus epsilon. And then for any family of covers of this complex, all the, family, all the members in these covers, no matter how you take the cover, will be expanders. So this is an easy way to construct expander once you know that locally you're a good expander. So if Kashdan property T is, it's a mother group approach. So this is a baby link approach. Once you know at the smallest uh, part of the tower that uh, the links are good, then you're done. Uh, uh, Shai, you, maybe you want to say what covers we uh, are what, <laughs> for? Uh, I, so there is a topological notion of covers, but to be honest, I'm going to uh, give later examples just with Kali graphs. Okay. So, uh, I mean... Yeah, I didn't mean the topological one. It's a very natural notion, so it's... Uh, yeah. But so, if you give examples, fine, yeah. Yeah. They, they, they will appear right after I'll, I'll prove the theorem. Uh, okay, so the proof of the uh, Oppenheim, uh, Oppenheim theorem. Uh, Oppen uh, uh, sorry, I just the way you formulate Oppenheim put uh, somewhat uh, more. I mean, this uh, formulation appears in Zook's paper, uh, you know, probably 15 years before. Uh, I'm going to formulation. Yeah. Okay, so I'm going to discuss Zook result as well, uh, and then and then we can talk about uh, uh, who who did what and. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting, uh, yeah. In any case, I, I'm calling this Oppenheim theorem because uh, this specific proof using, which used only num uh, basic linear algebra was shown to me uh, by Zar Oppenheim. And it's, I, I, I really think it's quite a, a beautiful and, okay, so, we have also Juke uses only linear algebra. Yeah, I, I'm going to use also Juke notation, but Juke in some point. I, okay, so I'll. I'll okay, maybe you want to discuss it after you show that. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so we have the adjacency operator of the global underlying graph and the local adjacency operators. Note that A is normalized by K1 and A. Oh, it, it should be here AV, I'm sorry and AV is normalized by K2. And uh, we'll assume that X is connected from now on. And so the constant function is the eigenvector, the unique eigenvector of the uh, maximal eigenvalue one. And I'll denote by L02 to be the subspace of functions of, uh, orthogonal to the constant function. And so when I restrict A to this subspace, I get the second or the second value. And I'll need to introduce some uh, project, natural projection operators. So for any vertex V, I can think of the following uh, projection operator rho V as the simple uh, operator that puts zeros on all the vertices which are not neighbors of V. And, and now I can define for any function, I can, I can always uh, uh, restrict a function to the link and I can define, I can split the function to uh, the part, the, the projection of the function to the, uh, to the uh, one dimensional vector space spanned by the constant function in the link and it's orthogonal complement. And note, this is, this is, by the way, this is uh, important. Note that the pro if you take a function in the link and you uh, project it to the constant uh, 
to the space spanned by the constant uh, function, then the length of the, I mean, the, the constant appearing in front of the constant function under this projection is precisely the value of the adjacency operator uh, applied to the function evaluated the vertex. It's simple to check, but it's, it, it will play a role, this simple. And now I'm going to uh, um, mention some lemmas. All of them have a simple one-line proof relating the adjacency operator with this projection. And, and th there is nothing, there is really nothing deep here. It's, you just need to verify it. I won't waste your time with the complete verification. So for instance, in equation 26, you see the relation between uh, projection the actual adjacency operator uh, to the link and the local adjacency operator. And you see there is some normalizing uh, constant that you need to multiply, but other than that, uh, rho v, a rho v is essentially a v. And also if you sum up all the, all the projection, all the projection of the global adjacency operator, you will get the adjacency operator, but you counted every, you counted everything k2 times. So there is a constant of k2 appearing. The next line is, uh, is really is the consequences of uh, this identity, because we know that f uh, parallel to v is just an eigenvector with eigenvalue one of the local adjacency operator. And similarly, uh, the other side, uh, on the right side of uh, uh, fact number 27, uh, we just note that if I'm orthogonal to the constant function, if I'm locally orthogonal to the constant function, then the eigenvalues, uh, uh, so I, I can bound the, the local operators apply to this function can bound it by the second largest eigenvalue times the size of the function. And also uh, fact number 28, just uh, summing it up and making sure that. So the, the left-hand side of 28 is, you know, it's just, uh, 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 so it's a, it's a simple summation argument. And the right-hand side uses this key observation, knowing that if you sum up over all the parallel parts of a function f, so given a function f, you sum over all the, the parallel components of f with respect to each vertex, you get uh, this identity. So Shai, I mean, uh, yeah, it's, it's uh, I completely agree. This, uh, these are all simple formula, simple to verify, simple linear algebra. But I mean, the, maybe a high level, you know, sort of plan of this proof is that how do you prove that the adjacency operator of the big graph is expanding if you know only the local ones? Yeah. Uh, what you are going to do is to show that you can write the uh, big one as an average of the small ones. And uh, luckily, uh, the decomposition that we want between the um, uh, constant functions on which we don't care what happens, or we know exactly what happens. And the ones orthogonal to the constant functions, both locally and globally, behave just like we want. So this is summarized in this uh, yeah. equation. So I'm, I'm, I wanted to actually write the precise proof. So I, I needed this. Yeah, 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 I'm not arguing. I'm just adding to yeah. the precise proof. <laughs> OK. So the, this is correct, and, and this is this is the uh, I, in, this is what you just described, but uh, in some sense, it's it's an inequality that once you prove it, it's a basic proof. Here's the proof. But if you're a bit reckless in how you estimate things, and you say forget this minus mu here, then the inequality means nothing. It's completely useless. But if you calculated it correctly using the previous lemmas and uh, applying the uh, what uh, the explanation that uh, that Avi just described, this is the averaging. So the first is so in uh, 
quality 30, this is precisely the averaging that uh, Avi mentioned. And you, so you take the uh, global agency operator, you break it into the local ones. And then you take the sum over all the vertices outside. And then you break every function F to the part of it which is parallel to V and the part of it which is uh, orthogonal uh, to the constant function in V. And you estimate both of them separately. So estimating the part that it's parallel to V, that's easy because the part it's parallel to V, it's, it's kind of, it's have a nice expression. It's, it's all inequalities and you'll get uh, at the end of the, the day, the norm of the adjacency operator applied to F. And uh, estimating the part that it's perpendicular to the, constant, to the local constant functions. This requires just a tiny bit of care. So here you're just using the fact that mu is the local, it's the maximum among all the local uh, eigenvalues. Again, now you, you don't just say that this expression is smaller than this expression. That's right, but you, you take one extra step and you make sure that the, you, you, just, you, you do a Pythagoras, and you say that uh, the part perpendicular, it's, it's comprised of the part, it's the local part minus the part parallel to V, and you get away with uh, this estimate. And you get a tiny save of minus mu at the end of the day. So here are all the details. In the previous slide, you just need to verify a few lemmas. And at the end of the day, you have this inequality. Some, I don't know if the people that study analysis, I'm not very, I'm not familiar with the, uh, the many results coming from analysis, but I, and, and I don't know if this has some uh, well-known, well-established name, and maybe in differential geometry, but in any case, once you have this simple inequality, the proof follows immediately. No, that's, that's a mean max theorem. Now, now it's just a min max. This is the min max, yeah? No, now you, you get this and you divide by f, by the norm square of f, and that's the yeah, min exactly. max theorem. Exactly. So you, you now pick f to be an eigenvalue with the largest, uh, an eigenvector with the largest eigenvalue lambda, and you divide by the norm of f, and you get, uh, you get from, the min, from the key inequality, you get this estimate, you play with it a bit, and then you get it. That's it. Okay, can you go back to the previous one? Uh, the, this key ingredient where you split up the, the F perpendicular, how do you do this here? And well, uh, so you just... I'll go just one more slide, so... Uh, oh, yeah. I see, you, you just use this, uh, and how do you, but you take its norm. Yeah, so the, the, they are orthogonal to each other, the perpendicular and the parallel. So if you multiply them, you'll get, so the, the, the inner product should be zero. So you break. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Again, basic linear algebra, just orthogonality and Frobenius theorems and nothing else. And, okay. Any question about the proof of Oppenheim theorem? So at this point, it looks like you really, really needed the regularities, the regularities assumptions that you used, like mm -hmm. both the K1 regular and the K2 regular. Yes. So in, in this okay. proof, it, it simplifies the argument considerably, I agree, but it's not, uh, it's not necessary. It's not essential? It's not essential, no. Also, if, if you, I mean, this is this proof. Uh, I I learned it from uh, from uh, talking with Izar, and he actually wrote on the board. And uh, I I'm not sure that you will able to find this uh, key inequality in his work stated like that. But of course, you can just read this paper and and see the proof there. Uh, and it, it stops. It makes an emphasis on stopping it. This uh, equation 
we basically do it. Uh, well, he does it, he does it much generally. If you, if you are interested in reading his work, I, I suggest for the first time restricting yourself to dimension two because these are a uh, bit in quite the high generalities. Okay, so now, uh, as Avi mentioned before, uh, Juk proved it. Well, okay, so first I want to introduce, uh, I, I do want to mention a, a, a property which has to be called the Juk property. Uh, I, I, I want to tell you how to uh, find graphs satisfying this, uh, uh, this excellent expansion uh, property, lo excellent local expansion. And we do it by finding certain infinite groups I'll give you an example in a second. If you have to keep something in mind, think of the group of three by three matrices with integer coefficients. And we're looking for to, so, and so gamma will be an infinite group and S will be a finite symmetric set of generators of gamma. And for a pair, such a pair of gamma and S, we define the link graph uh, to be similar to what we saw in the Mumford case. The vertices of the link graph is the elements of S and two such elements are connected if the inverse of one times the other also is an element of S. And we call such a pair Juk if for some epsilon this, the normalized second largest eigenvalue of the link graph is sm uh, smaller than half minus epsilon. Here actually it could, it could be less or equal. I don't know why I wrote strictly and just as a reminder, uh, recall there is the notion of uh, Cayley graphs and specifically for infinite groups, it's, it's very nice uh, to construct their associate Cayley graphs by picking a finite index normal subgroup in gamma, making the quotient gamma mod n a finite group and just taking the Cayley graph of uh, the finite group G and the set of generators S. So this is the Cayley graph and note that in this specific in this specific case, the link graph is always L of S. It is independent of L. This is what I mean by a local to global. You will only need to know information about this graph, and in some sense, it doesn't really depend on G at all. And so this is the you can now deduce. Uh, the following corollary from the theorem of Oppenheim, if you have an infinite uh, group gamma and a, generate, a symmetric generating set S and they are Juk, then uh, this, uh, this gives you a family of expander graphs, which are size of S regular and epsilon uniform expanders. And to make this result, and to get from this result uh, an infinite family, you need to assume from now on <laughs> some condition coming from group theory, meaning that the, the group gamma has a lot of finite index normal subgroups. Uh, but in some sense, I don't think you know of any example in which it doesn't happen. And so the most common example is just taking the, the, the special linear, uh, uh, so the, the, the group of three by three matrices with the integer coefficient determinant one, and these, all these congruent subgroups satisfy the condition. You have clearly, you have infinitely many of them. More generally, you can take arithmetic groups. You can replace SL3 with other matrix groups, symplectic, orthogonal, whatever you want. You can re replace the ring of integers with other rings of integers like polynomials over finite fields. And there are many examples. Okay, so now to Avi's remark. Uh, I, 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 want, I want to first describe historically where, does, where did this idea, uh, I mean, how it is related to the work of Juk. Oppenheim theorem is built much later after uh, Juk uh, proved his uh, important result from 2003. Okay, so 1967, Kashdan introduces famous property T and prove it for uh, SL3Z. Uh, several years afterward, Margulis used this property T. In a way, you, you use it for the group SL3Z to construct 
expanders. The first explicit family of expanders. Uh, and in 2003, Juke introduced his criteria and he also came up, he, he, def, he introduced his notion of uh, Juke set in different terminology, but essentially the same definition. And he showed that if such a pair satisfied the ju uh, it, it, it is a juk, then the group gamma has Kashdan uh, property T. And now you can combine Margulis and juk and get families of expanders, but juk did not construct expanders. And his result, I mean, you can, uh, you can claim that this is semantics and you can also rightfully claim that juk obviously know Margulis' work and he knew how to deduce expanders from it. And I, I'll agree to both of them. Uh, and so you can say that uh, Oppenheim, uh, the conclusion of Oppenheim theorem is a combination of Margulis and, Margulis and Juke. Uh, fine. Yeah, I want, uh, actually, I think that uh, yeah, Oppenheim's uh, result is extremely important because uh, it uh, generalizes this for the even though the proof is the same, you generalize it to a high dimensional expanders and this is really useful for the different random works uh, that are defined on uh, high dimensional expanders. So it's not, uh, yeah, I have no complaints to Oppenheim. I just want to say that the same proof appears, the proof you showed basically appears in Zuch's paper. It proves exactly what you say, which in some sense is a stronger result because it implies expanders by Margulis' uh, well-known right. at the time. But it's not, uh, I have no, no issue. I, I love Oppenheim's paper and I think it's very important for uh, its application in the, um, you know, uh, for high dimensional expanders. Because Juke was interested mainly in, in Cayley graphs and he was interested in Gromov's model of random groups. This was one of his, uh, important motivation. So he just cared about other things, but the proof is basically the same. Okay. Uh, by the way, why, what was Margulis' motivation for creating expanders? <laughs> uh, Margulis uh, was asked by uh, Pinsker, who was uh, uh, who needed expanders, but uh, could only prove that they existed by a probabilistic argument. Uh, for reasons coming from cold coding theory and reasons coming from uh, um, uh, fault tolerance in circuits. Anyway, uh, he um, he asked whether there are explicit examples. And I, the way I imagine this conversation, Margulis immediately said yes. <laughs> I know that's my uh, vision. Uh, as as uh, two Jews in Russia, they could not get good jobs in uh, the university and. Uh, they were together in some, I don't know, institute for something. Uh, but anyway, they, a lot of good work was done in this place, as you can see. Yeah. Okay, so now, uh, once we have this uh, criterion, the uh, criterion, one may ask how can we find or construct pairs satisfying the, the Juke property? If we have them and if the groups are say, uh, you know, have a lot of finite index normal subgroups, then we'll be able to easily construct expanders. Uh, now, the, my current uh, really lack of knowledge uh, is that I know very few examples of group satisfying the Juke criteria. Uh, and, all, and all the examples I have in mind come from number theory and group theory. This is, this is where I, I, I know they come from. This is the motivation for the constructions. If you don't want the motivation, you don't want to learn number theory and group theory, I can just give you the set of generators, S. Uh, but I think one can really ask, uh, can you, come up with a different way, just forget number theory and group theory. Can you come up with a different way to find set S, say in the group of three by three matrices with integers, such that gamma S is juke? Is there another way to construct a juke sets? 
talk uh, another comment. At first, since you call them Zook, uh, this uh, Zook property all the time, so people should remember Zook property just means that the links are extremely good expanders. Yeah. And uh, um, the other thing is that uh, one can ask this question outside the context of group theory completely. Can you come up with graphs? All yeah. of those links are excellent expanders. Yeah. Or you are going to do this. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I can't do it, but I can ask the question. Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. If we're coming from high dimensional expanders and we don't know the answer. Uh, and by the way, we don't, we don't just interested in explicit, even give me a random proof that they exist. It would be amazing. Can, can you say if like intuitively, I guess that there should be graphs which are uh, which have this property but are not but you cannot uh, describe them as the as the Cayley graph of any group uh, right so it, it feels like you you can just use like it's like the, the difference between a, a regular covering like a regular uh, tiling of the plane and uh, something which is an irregular tiling of the plane so no, I, I don't know how to, even without, throw the yes. cables, even if, if you are trying to tile something and try to construct a, a graph or a complex by hand, I don't know how you can do it such that the links are excellent expanders. I really don't. I, I don't know if you can do it in any type of geometry, hyperbolic geometry, whatever. And, and uh, there is a trade-off. If you just put in elements inside S, the note that you you will cause yourself some damage. No, I, I don't want to do it. Once you, I don't want to do it through the graph setting. But may, never mind. We can talk later. But, but even geometrically, I don't know how, how how it can be done. I I would be very happy to hear that somebody have an idea how to do such a thing. I don't I don't know how to. Of course, I do have examples. It's, we already saw one example coming from Mumford. Uh, we have a, we have many examples of such pairs. Gamma, which is a group generated by a finite set of uh, elements S, such that the links are excellent expanders. Uh, the, the second largest eigenvalue is strictly smaller than a half, and they follow so. Um, Many of them are of the following form. So again, gamma is just a group generating by S. S is a collection of matrices, uh, three by three uh, matrices, modulo scalar. This time inside the field of rational functions over a finite field. It's, it's easier to find the, these sets S there. And we, can, we have many collections of sets S such that the link graph will be just the projective line versus the point versus line uh, graph. And whenever we are in this situation where the link is the point versus line uh, graph in the projective plane, then we are immediately in a case where we are, uh, we are satisfying Zhuk criterion. Uh, again, these graphs have excellent expansion property and if you want an explicit example, so here's an explicit example. You take S to be the following set of 14 matrices defined. So by this condition with respect to these two matrices, T and R. Again, this is one specific example. It's part of a much more general family of examples coming from the work of uh, Cartwright, Montero, Steger, and Zappa. Uh, uh, Cartwright and uh, Steger actually uh, have been working, have uh, many works on building very uh, uh, interesting arithmetic groups with special properties. This is this, uh, the fact that the link graph is the line versus plane of projective, uh, uh, line versus, uh, point versus line, the projective plane is one of the special properties that they have been studied and they have many, many examples uh, of such generating sets. For any prime P, prime uh, power Q, you can, they, they tell you how to generate TNR. 
if you don't like working over the field of polynomials, you should know that Kartek, Montero, Steger, and Zappa also gave you Zhuk sets uh, for three by three matrices over quadratic extension over the, the number fields, like the Mumford example. Initially, they only dealt with uh, Q equal two and three, but uh, now we know how to extend the work for any point Q. So we have a lot of examples of juke, uh, juke sets. And if you want to understand the proof why those, their sets satisfy that the, the link graph is the point versus line in the graph of point versus line in the projective plane, then the proof requires some knowledge of division algebras. On the other hand, if you're just interested in building one explicit family of expanders, you can just pick one CMS Z set and check it by hand. So it's, it's a set of size 14, you get a graph that you can easily check to be, to satisfy this uh, property. And again, let me reiterate, uh, I don't know how to construct such uh, generating sets uh, generally without using arithmetic groups. And I'll be very happy to know if anybody has any idea uh, how to construct a generating set not coming from arithmetic groups. Just, you don't need to, you don't need to satisfy the, the fact that the link graph is the graph of points versus line. You just need to satisfy this property. And I don't know how to do it uh, without appealing to the theory of arithmetic groups. And so uh, one, okay, so just to tell you, once you have one such set uh, satisfying the Zhu criterion, and just, uh, I can just tell you that you have a lot of graphs with this exact generating set. The graphs come from taking the group or the generating set modulus some uh, polynomial, and this uh, tells you that you can essentially think of your finite groups as sitting inside the group of uh, PGL3 over a finite field, the finite field extension of FQ, uh, the set S, the elements of the set S also lives inside this finite group, um, assuming some mild condition over the polynomial. And so you can look at the set S as sitting there. You can look at the, the group it generates. And in this case, it's uh, this subgroup. And then you can conclude using Zhuk or Oppenheim uh, together with the, the explicit uh, construction of the set by Kartek, Monter Montero, Steger, and Zeppa and conclude that you have a family of expanders. Uh, it's an elementary construction, I think. Uh, no need, you don't need to know any representation theory. And again, one small caveat, I, I, oh, XP is the graph, is this graph, sorry. So um, what you get is, uh, I mean, it would be nicer to say that this graph is an expander. For this, you need to prove connectivity so one challenge left unanswered is the, to show that the, uh, the, the bigger graph is actually connected. And so, yeah, so this will be a very short talk. Sorry, Abi. I only have, uh, I thought it would uh, take, uh, take me longer. Um, uh, so just in, in conclusion, uh, we have uh, so Garland's, local to global method, as was uh, proved in this case by Zhuk and by Oppenheim, uh, tell us, uh, give us a simple proof of uh, expansion using just local information. And yeah, so I, I wrote some two, two problems I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about maybe, uh, uh, so I just thought to put them out there. One is supposed to be much easier than the other one, just showing that. So there are many natural Cayley graphs that you can 
uh, apply the Garland's method to them, I think this is one of the simpler, uh, but you just need to, instead of working with all the matrices, you might need to uh, look at only orthogonal matrices. Uh, wait, what, what's the nature of the, what's, the, what's different in this challenge? Maybe you can uh, elaborate a bit. Yeah, so the challenge, uh, okay, so I, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell you what is the challenge and then I'll explain what is a bit interesting about this challenge. Okay, so you need to prove uh, using the local to global method that uh, the following graphs, scaling graphs are expanders. And so you take any D greater or equal to three, fix it. Uh, you might need to pick a prime P. P determines you the set of generators, which is uh, somewhat larger than D. I don't know, we'll, you'll have to check. But let's assume that P is also a fixed, but a big prime. And now you look at the family when Q grows to infinity. So this family of uh, Cayley graphs, the groups in the Cayley graphs are the orthogonal D by D matrices. Orthogonal meaning this condition right here on the right. Uh, but evaluated at the, the ring of Z mod Q. If you would like, take Q to be prime, so it's evaluated at the field of Q elements. Now, what is the generating set? The generating set is, it also has a, a quite nice description. It actually comes from, uh, so you take all the matrices, D by D matrices, which are orthogonal, and whose coordinates belongs to not the ring of integers, you're allowed to take rational numbers whose denominator is P. So slightly bigger than the ring of integers. And so this should be a very explicit family of graphs. Uh, of, uh, this, is, this should be a computable, this set SP. And essentially you, you should be able to compute the link graph of SP. And you should be able to deduce that these graphs are expanders. And this will give a, a slightly simpler, it's a, a, a simpler gen, a family of expanders with a simpler description of the generating set. Not like in the Mumford where I kind of told you there are two magical elements. So in the CMSC, there are two magical elements. Here you just, it's, I don't know, it's, it's subjective, but I think it's, it's a more straightforward definition of a generating set. The challenge is, just, I'll just take two steps you don't have this trivially. It's not even true for the generating set I, uh, I described. You will have to prove this slightly weaker condition. So there is a trade-off. You don't have this nice description of the link graph and the link graph won't be a nice graph of lines versus plane. You will have maybe let the computer run and prove that uh, it, it is a Zhuk generating set. It satisfies the Zhuk criterion, but it's, uh, I, I don't know, it's, it requires work. You need to do something. The next challenge, I think, uh, uh, the next challenge I have it in mind because of uh, Ozawa's talk from two weeks ago. So I'm- uh, just, uh, just one more question. SP, it, the way it's described, it's not obvious that it's finite. Oh, it, it, it's, it's not that obvious, but it's pretty obvious because you're think think about the you're taking the the entire compact Lie group of orthogonal matrices. It's compact, and you intersect it with a, a discrete set. This M D P minus one of Z. It's discrete. So intersection of discrete and compact. It's it will be fine. Okay. And the next challenge is, I, I think this is, this is very important to, uh, in order to make this uh, local to global method uh, more appealing uh, in application. It, it would be nice if it would have been applied to the nicest and simplest generating set of the group, uh, of uh, the group uh, SLD, of the group of matrices. I mean, 
it, it would be nicer if one can prove, use the local to global method on simpler generating sets, like the most elementary generating sets. So EIJ is the matrix with one in the IJ coordinate and zero elsewhere. And this is a very natural generating set. And, and currently I don't know how, uh, if uh, Garland's method or the Joux criterion can be applied to S at all. You see, here we have a very large group, S, a very large set SP. This set is not that large. It's, and so um, you need to come up with another method to prove uh, via local to global method expansion. But this I think is part of the, what is now called the semi-definite uh, programming uh, method to prove spectral gap. And so this is going beyond Garland's method, beyond Schuch, beyond Oppenheim. But I, I think the, there's room to be optimistic, to be able to come up with a simple proof that these are expanders. Again, not going through property theorem. Uh, okay, so that's all. Thank you very much for your for coming here. All right, uh, thanks, Shai. This was. This was great. So let's uh, let's have questions. Can I ask? I need body camera. Uh, I, I asked so many, so much, so many questions. By now, I want to give other people the, <laughs> the opportunity. Uh, I, no, first of all, I I was not sure what what exactly did Garland did, and what, what was his motivation. So yeah, it's, it's weird. I haven't mentioned Garland's original results at all this talk, yeah. Uh, so uh, I mentioned it in the previous talk I, uh, I gave last week. Garland's work was, as, okay, so here's, uh, I can even uh, be concrete here. So you look at this group, right? At this uh, graph. It's a graph, but actually it has a high dimensional structure. It is part of a bigger, uh, it is the underlying graph of a complex. And the complex is, uh, the complex is better described not as a Cayley graph, but it's some um, space whose fundamental group, it's a complex whose fundamental group is an arithmetic group like gamma, like uh, uh, similar to S, where is it? Uh, arithmetic group of the following form, like SL3Z or slightly more general. And Garland's motivation was that he wanted to prove something about these arithmetic groups. So you are able to prove something about, and, and what he wanted to prove is to show that their cohomology vanishes. So to prove that the cohomology of a group vanishes is the same as saying that the proof of the associated complex vanishes. And to prove that the, the cohomology vanishes, uh, in order to prove it, he invented the local to global method. He invented the whole idea of looking at the links and using the same thing that Oppenheim did, but to prove not uh, bounds on the spectral gap of the adjacency operator, but bounds on the, uh, so uh, uh, proving spectral gap for higher dimensional adjacency operators. So we studied adjacency operators going from vertices to vertices. You can also study going from edges to edges, through triangles and so on. And he proved spectral gap for all of them. And Proving spectral gap is a way to prove that the cohomology vanishes. And this was his main motivation. This was his main result. But in, in a way, his philosophy is easily described and elementally described for graphs. And this is what I wanted to show you today, just what does Garland method means for expansion in graphs. Everything I said applies in, high, in higher, for higher dimensional things and uh, it gives you results and, and all of, and this is why everything I, 
here I'm, I'm talking about Garland's method because he really just invented uh, this way of proving things. And, and another question, do you have any smaller example for um, than the fourth invertible graph? So these are kind of the building blocks of these, ex these expanders. Is there any smaller building block? Uh, smaller projective planes. Smaller <laughs> projective planes. Seven points. It's just the uh, you know the bipartite analog. So the smallest you have is. Uh, but yeah, you you, you must you must need some kind of a structure like a projective plane or something like that. You know. No 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 no, 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 no. Just this is the reason these ones have fourteen vertices. But you can you maybe yeah. come up with others, not necessarily from projective geometry. Yeah, I mean I. I, I, I'll, I'll throw a guess and I can't tell you uh, why I, I'm choosing this number, but I think the minimal set of S that satisfy the Juk property have to be at the very least seven. Just like a graph, but a two regular graph can be an expander. So you have to have at least degree three in, in, in dimension uh, two, you have to have degree at least six. This is my guess. And so we are now dealing, I mean, we're bargaining. So I gave you a 14 and you tell me something smaller then I'll tell you, you can't go be, beyond seven. So, uh, yeah, seven. so this is, this is the, the range of uh, our discussion. I, I don't have any. Uh, no, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's supposed to be a, like an easy task for a computer to run and, and check what are all the building blocks. Yeah. If you if you the problem is not to check whether a little graph is uh, you know uh, has this property by a computer, even if it's not so small. No 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 no. I I I I'm I'm actually thinking about trying to do some kind of a tiling procedure like that. But for that you need. Uh, you need a building block that you can that you can play with that you can that you that you have the ability to yeah exactly that you know this how is, to how to the, patch them together. This is the difficulty. Yeah? There's and, no and yeah. with the fourteen vertices. It's uh, it seems hard, but if you have something which is smaller that you can play with, uh, you, know, you need to be careful what you're tiling because. Remember, Once you have local to global, you don't need to be careful. Not what no, you're guys, guys, let me okay, let yeah, yeah, just yeah. Uh, stop this discussion just because maybe it's getting too personal uh, or yeah. just uh, uh, two people mainly involved. So first, let me, before Leo continues, uh, let me ask if there are any other questions to, to Shai. All right, good. So, uh, good. So, I first let me thank Shai again, uh, everybody. Uh, this was great, and people may also.